that figure that Dr Adrian Bull mentioned of up to 500 people dying each week as a result of delays in their care, is that accurate, do you think? Well, I don't think anyone knows exactly what that figure would be, but there's no question that when the NHS is under the kind of pressure that we're under right now, that there are consequences in terms of harms and risks uh, for patients. And the fundamental issue here is that we are still, as a health service, in a position of uh, fragility. And it's important to say we don't always have winter crises. There was a time uh, when we'd had sustained investment over several years, you know, over a decade ago, when, when it was not usual to have a winter crisis in the NHS. But then we had the 10 years of uh, austerity. That meant we went into COVID in a fragile state, and that meant COVID hit us harder, our health service and other health services. It meant that, for example, we had a, a bigger increase in people uh, waiting for so we went into this winter knowing we're in a fragile state. I don't think anyone was under, under any illusions um, that would be difficult. If you then get what, what we've seen, which is a huge growth in flu, and people who are frail and vulnerable in hospital with flu, and also the impact that, that the flu has on our own staffing, then I'm afraid you, you get to the situation we're in, which is that most parts of the health service, and you know, we focus on hospitals, but this is true of mental health services, community services, primary care, uh, are, are under almost unbearable strain. And that does mean that we're not able to provide services as usual. We have to focus all our energies on the most urgent and, uh, uh, and intense uh, needs. And that's why you're seeing the declaration of critical incidences in so many places. Are you saying that those years of austerity have essentially broken the NHS? I don't think there's much doubt about that. We had half as much growth in uh, health spending as we, you know, health economists around the world, when they look at a country like Britain with an ageing population, will say that we need growth of around 4% a year, and we had growth of around 2% a year for a decade. Uh, and that meant we went into the COVID crisis, 30, 40 billion pounds less spending than uh, other con uh, comparative uh, countries. We went in with 100,000 vacancies. We went in with very low capital spending, so we don't have the buildings, we don't have the equipment that we need. We're not as productive uh, as we could be. And I think the really difficult thing is this today. What I'd like to say is this, that, that you know, during COVID, we absolutely said, didn't we, that we wanted to learn the lessons from COVID when we saw the way that the health service responded, but also the way in which the health service had to stop doing almost everything else. Uh, and we wanted to learn those lessons. But yet we've gone into this winter in an even greater sense, of, with an even greater degree of fragility than we went into COVID. And we can see the consequences. So what we have to do, you know, this winter is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, what we have to do is do everything we can to try to minimise harms and risks this winter. And one of the things that is vital is that as ministers return to their desks, we do need to see a resolution to the industrial action that, that threatens four more days of strike action in January. And then when we have got through the winter, because in the end, the NHS will get through, even if we have to get through in ways which are very, very difficult for us and for patients and for the public, then we've got to have a conversation about what we need to do to not go into next winter in the same position of fragility that we've gone into this one. I mean, how does the industrial action get resolved, though? Because you'll know that uh, uh, while it's about conditions, a lot part of it is also about pay and the argument of course is that if you pay staff more then you don't have enough money for other parts of the service well we need leadership you know i, I understand the government's position um, limits on public spending worries around inflation i absolutely understand the trade union's position which is around the fact that their members have taken real pay cuts that we have a crisis in recruitment, retention and motivation in the health service, over 130,000 vacancies. So in a sense, I understand why both sides would say, well, we're not going to move, but this is why we need leadership. We need to look at what's unfolding in the health service today. We need to recognise that January is the toughest month for the health service. And, and, and government needs to be willing to negotiate uh, in the right spirit, and trade unions need to be willing to enter into those negotiations because to put four days of industrial action on top of what you're hearing about today, then we will absolutely increase, increase those risks and harms to patients. There is no question. And so we need people to be, pro we need politicians, the trade unions to be pragmatic, to be creative, to find a way through this, not to heap extra pressures on a system that is hardly coping right now.
OK, so what does that pragmatism look like then, Matthew? Do you want politicians to negotiate over pay? Yet you, you pointedly didn't mention pay when you talked about negotiating. And, and do you want to see trade unions bring down some of their pay demands? Well, look, this is the way negotiation works. Both sides have got a starting point. Um, but it does look at the moment as though the, 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 the reason we can't make any progress at all is that the government will not negotiate about pay. And as long as the government refuses to negotiate about pay, I don't see the trade unions entering into negotiation. Now, clearly, when the trade unions enter into negotiation, it's a negotiation. They move from their starting point. That's how it works. But at the moment, there's no conversation going on. People are adopting fixed positions. And as long as they adopt those fixed positions, we continue to walk into four days of industrial action. Now, you know, your report has vividly described the pressures we're under now. January is our toughest month. The idea that we can then take two days of nurses' strikes, two days of ambulance staff strike, on top of all of this, without there being major implications for patients, well, you know, it's, it, it, it's a fantasy. There will be more harm, there will be more risk. I mean, what's it going to look like then after those extra four days of industrial action this month as uh, services facing the winter pressures? Well, it will look different in different places. And we will once again have to ask the public to support us. So in the last ambulance dispute, we saw a significant reduction in 999 calls. Now, we're grateful to the public for doing that. But whilst it's always important that the public use the health service in the right way, if you're worried about your health, then use 111, use the NHS website, use primary care, only ring 999 if you have a life-threatening emergency. The, the problem is, as we saw during COVID, that if people stop using the health service because they think it's not there, and there's reports today in Scotland about this, uh, then all that happens is that those illnesses worsen and, and that we build up more pressures for the future. So the situation we're in now, where it's difficult for the NHS to cope, where so many parts of it having to declare critical incidents, we're not able to provide the range of services. Well, that's a problem here and now for people who are having uh, operations uh, cancelled, waiting for ambulances. But it's also a problem for the future because it means that we as a population become sicker and that drives future pressures. So, look, the, the government has provided extra money to help get people out of hospital, because, as you know, one of the issues we've got is over 10,000 patients in hospital who don't need to be there. But that money was announced late. It was distributed even later. And so it's not been able to make much difference this year. What we've got to do uh, when we've got through this winter somehow is we've got to think about how we invest money and how we do things differently so that we don't enter next winter in the same position of fragility. And that's what I would say to people, help us to get through these difficult times, but also heap pressure on the government uh, to, to act in ways which, which mean that we, we don't have to feel this way this time next year. So look, new year, new week, new start. What's your message to the health secretary and to the leaders of the unions to try and get this thing resolved? Because no one wants to see those strikes take place again in a couple of weeks' time. I think I want to say this is an extraordinary time. I, I speak to NHS leaders you know, just about every day, and a lot of them, if not most of them, say that this is the toughest winter they've dealt with. We cannot go on like this. We can't be sitting here next year saying, well, this is even tougher than last year. So we need, with the support of the public and others, to get through this difficult time. And I call on the trade unions and government to find a, a way of, of getting through this industrial, stopping this industrial action taking place. But then we've got not, we mustn't get used to this. You know, we mustn't be in a situation, we, we somehow accept that the NHS being in this kind of position of critical incidents, crisis and winter is inevitable in a country uh, as rich as ours, with the health service, with the strengths that we've got. You know, if we have the resources, we can do remarkable things, as we showed during COVID, as we've shown to the vaccination programme. You know, one of the sad things about the kinds of pressures we're under now is that we're not able to make the progress we did make before the winter in reducing the number of people waiting a long time for operations, uh, in accelerating our diagnostic services. So the health service can do the job if it's given the resources and the support to do so. But at the moment, the fundamental capacity issues are in danger of getting worse. As I said, we went into COVID with 100,000 plus vacancies. We've now got 130,000 plus vacancies. So what we need is a national plan once we've got through the worst of this winter and a national plan geared towards that absolute commitment that we will enter next winter in a, in a, more, in a more resilient state.